Nice. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome back. EHC is back. We've been gone for a while because we've been watching baseball. The Cleveland Indians are playing some games. Joining me today, a brand new co-host. You might know him from WFNY, from IBI, from EHC, and every other delineated by abbreviation website you can think of. His name is Michael Hattery. Michael Hattery, welcome to the EHC podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just, I think we've tried this shtick a lot, and this is like the best hook you've ever done with it to enter. I'm, I'm, well, I'm down. I'm down to clown. After 150 episodes, it just keeps getting better. I know. I think our, I think our goal, and this, this is not saying we're leaving anytime soon anywhere. I think we're happy at WFNY, but perhaps our goal is just to just to podcast at every website in Cleveland. Is there a cooking website? I, I, I can whip up some mean rosemary potatoes. I'm actually very good in the kitchen, so I'd be content with that. Whatever. Whatever you want. I can flambe. I don't know what you want from me. So for the next EHC show, we should put together some cooking elements with the EHC boys as we've somehow become known. I don't know why that is, but we are WFNY people. But if they want to keep calling us EHC, I guess we call ourselves that. But hey, well, someday we'll break out of that niche. Anyways, we've got some Cleveland Indian baseball to talk about. And before we start talking about specifics, Mike, we are uh, past a week into the season. Obviously, if you just look at the record, it's been a very middling sort of start. And, and I guess in... If you look historically at Terry Francona's starts uh, for the Indians, they've kind of been like this, maybe worse. Uh, his his Aprils have not been glamorous, and, and this has not been a glamorous first week. Of course, you know, hot take reaction theater is that the team stinks, so we should trade Edwin and Carnacion. But um, what's your takeaway, Mike, from this first week of the season? What's the one thing that stands out to you, positive, and negative, one of each. What, what, positively, Mike, what, what's the one thing that stands out to you? Francisco Lindor is ready to go full bore on the best player in baseball for a year. Is it? I mean, is, I think I think that stands out. Is it? Is it possible that hyperbole of saying that he's in the land of Michael Trout isn't hyperbole? I mean, it's like really early, so I don't want to say that, but it's definitely possible. I, he just. Yeah. Like, adding power to his game when you're the best defensive shortstop in baseball, whatever. Screw you, Andrelton Simmons. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what you think. I don't care what your family thinks. <laughs> I'm sure they listen to us. Um, here's what I like about the power. You know, we were talking with Namina in one of our rambling off-air tr- uh, chat sessions, and I kind of offhandedly made a 30-home run remark. And, you know, I think the, the commonalities, if you – increase your your power production in a substantial way, you're going to screw up the rest of your game. The interesting piece to his power to me has been that it seems somewhat effortless. I mean, his swings, his power swings, he seems to be taking pitches where they're at, which is, you know, kind of simple and brilliant at the same time. Uh, And it's, it's been substantial power. We're not talking about balls that are just kind of nicking over the wall and it doesn't seem to be affecting the rest of his swing looks the same. Obviously, Mike, you talked about this two or three years ago in the podcast about how just size-wise and just musculature, he's going to be gaining weight. He's going to be getting bigger. Is this a case of that? I mean, is he just swinging the ball the same way, and he's just a bigger guy? He's going to hit more home runs, maybe a little bit smarter too. Yeah, I think he's definitely he started to pick on pitches inside more than he used to, I think. Um, but one of the things, you know, is that the game on – Wednesday night or Wednesday evening, six o'clock start. I don't know if that's night or evening. Who knows? Lord knows. Uh, but one of the things, you know, he just hit a ball halfway up the halfway up the wall to the opposite field and dead center, pretty close to dead center, halfway up that monster wall. And that was one of those moments where I was sort of like, okay, this is really interesting. Because um, I think we just see someone who's getting a lot stronger. You know, he's not just picking on pole field. He's not just picking here. I mean, this dude is just getting stronger and stronger. He's hitting the ball with more and more authority. The exit velocity is increasing. I mean, just really positive outcomes. And I think what's really interesting is, you know, he's really been the only hitter who's been hot for the Indians. Yeah. 
everyone else has underperformed, you know, for the first seven ga- eight games, and that's been fine. I mean, that's going to level out. That's how it goes. But the Indians are four and four, and they really haven't had a good offensive performance from anyone but Francisco Lindor, Lindor and, I mean, maybe Abraham Almonte a little bit. S- Santana, the first series, was hotter than a fire. That's I mean, fair. Maybe That's the, fair. the hottest the hottest center in baseball. But, I, I, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, one of the popular, you know, kind of the <laughs> metrics that people have been looking at, of course, exit velocity, but launch angle and uh, swing plane stuff. And, and, and I guess the one kind of interesting thing to note with Lindor, and I don't know, I don't know the dim- dimensions of his swing, other than it's been a good swing in past seasons, but he does seem to loop his swing a little bit this year. But I don't feel like, and, and, and you can talk a little bit more about this, Mike, but I don't feel like, I feel like his exit velocity has increased. I don't feel like he's changed the swing all that much. Um, it looks like he's got the same swing. Uh, obviously, you know, mentality-wise, you can see that he's kind of taken a, a different approach, especially when it looked like he cost Danny Salazar that game. Uh, during that opening series against Texas, uh, you know, is this just, uh, you know, talk a little bit about launch angle here. I mean, is, is the swing plane a little different or, or is this just a case of him taking pitches where they're at? Um, I mean, maybe the plane's a little different. I just think this is a guy who, look, when you have guys who are under 20, <laughs> I'm so boring, right? Like I have so little insight to add sometimes. And one of the things I've obsessed about over the last couple of years, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> one of the things I've obsessed about is like sort of how K rate relates to a guy who has great bad head control. And with Ramirez and Lindor, I've sort of been really interested to see, I think they're really fun test cases in that they have phenomenal bad head control constantly. And I just sort of think when you're in your early twenties, you have phenomenal bad head control, you're going to get larger and so, like, those barrels, people who can consistently barrel the baseball and get, you know, the best part of the bat head on the baseball, like, that's only going to improve production value as you move through your 20s, add 15 pounds in muscle, and get a little bigger. And I just think that that's what – that's a large part of what we're seeing. And, and I think there might be some swing choice. I think more of it, too, is something you and I talked about three or four years ago with Michael Brantley at the end of the season where we said, look, like, this guy is getting to the point where he's saying, you know, he's getting up in counts and then saying, you know, here's here's a section that I can take an advantage of, especially in Cleveland with a really short, not really short, but a really easy to take advantage of right field. And I think you saw that the other day where, I mean, it was certainly well hit, but we've seen Lindor just pick on right field for the first time where I think we didn't see that last year or the year before. And I think that's something he could really start to do more frequently. I, I, you know, story-wise, it's it's I, I, what's interesting to me. Kind of stepping off the field for a second before we get to maybe the one thing that you're worried about how in this first week is, is it's going to be interesting to kind of watch the Indians and how they handle Lindor this year because, it, you know, when you when you sign Jose Ramirez to that long-term deal and, and really a bargain price when you consider what Kipnis signed for um, three years ago. Um, they sign Ramirez. They sign Roberto Perez. Uh, rumblings of them talking to Carlos Santana. Not a whiff of discussion about Francisco Lindor. And there is no way that front office hasn't been pounding down his door saying, hey, here's this really awesome $70 million deal we've got for you. Um, this is going to be one of the ongoing stories. And I'm, I'm curious to see if the Lindor signing and, – and, and listen, we've got control with five years of control left. But – could this turn into at some point a LeBron-like story? I mean, Lindor is not from here, but when you consider how long he's been with the organization, the minor league system, I mean, he's been with this this organization now six years, five years, and it almost feels like he's from here. You know, he was a young kid when he signed. He's you know he's only twenty two now. Is this Mike going to be maybe a story that develops if they don't sign him to something ridiculous in the next year or so? And he continues to produce in, in ways that people aren't expecting. Is this going to turn into somewhat of a LeBron story where people start worrying about the end as opposed to taking what we get while we've got it? I mean, I think the only way that would is that if you and I became like plantation owner writers and wrote a book like The Whore of Akron, <laughs> um, I guess then it would be a s- similar circumstance. But um, I sur- it's a big problem. And I think one of the things that's really tough with Lindor, I was listening to 
like Carter Hawkins interview the other day, and he emphasized um, sort of how important it is that both sides see the like value of an extension. And for the first time, I was sort of like, I think they don't, you know, I think, I think Lindor may just not be a guy they can get an extension done with, which really stinks, because um, he's going to be the face of baseball. Um, well, it's well, not, it's not great. Well, when you when you when you put that kind of phrasing together, the face of baseball, and obviously ESPN has has thrown that out there, which, um, and and we've you know we've been talking about Lindor for so long, he, he feels like part of our culture now, but. Could the could could Lindor be the guy? You know, for years and years they've not broken the bank on guys close to to, to the age of thirty, and and you know you see the Angels make that big deal pre free agent with Mike Trout is, and you see the deal that they signed with uh, Edwin Encarnacion at a fairly advanced age, and is is as the Indians you know are kind of it seems like a lock playoff wise. That's never true, and I hate saying that in April, but. Is it possible that over the next three years, if the attendance stays the way it's at and, and they can project out, uh, especially with our system being fairly deep, is Lindor the guy that the Indians break the bank for? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I can't fathom that they put a, a trout deal out there, but is that what you think that maybe maybe Lindor and his agent have their eye on, especially when ESPN's throwing out the term in the face of baseball? Yeah, what's sort of scary is going to be what Bryce Harper is going to get this off season, right? Yeah, like that dude's going to Bryce Harper, who is the almost. I mean, listen, performance wise, you can say what you want about Bryce Harper, but man, this is not a guy that anybody has talked about like Lindor off the field. Lindor is like the dream off the field, and Harper is not that. So this does get interesting, doesn't it? So like Harper is probably going to get a three hundred million dollar guarantee in free agency. Like it's not. I mean, I've heard people talk about closer to four hundred million. I mean, we're talking like you can buy a franchise with this guy money. Um, so I think it's a concern. I just don't want to talk about it right now. Can I be honest? I just like I, I, I really get... hope the Indians are actually working this out and this isn't a thing. But I will say it's concerning that they don't have a deal done yet because that means that they either haven't gotten to the number of Lindor wants or Lindor isn't interested at all. Oh, man. Um, your, your your three hundred million dollar thought is not close to the seventy five million that I was bantering about in my piece. But well, so, well, obviously, like that's that's a different context. No, 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 like, no, 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 no. But I mean, I think I think the fact that he hasn't signed yet, and the Indians clearly, when you sign Jose Ramirez, the Indians have clearly talked to him. That sends messages, you know. Is is Lindor just waiting another year? Is this going to be something that happens during July? But let's get back into on the field stuff. Um, Lindor, of course, being the, the the main positive to start the year. But, Mike, there have been lots of slight concerns. You know, you can look at the rotation pieces right now. I guess you could point to some little things here and there. And um, I want to get into my positive when you're done. But um, negatives, you know, I mean, is it is it – you mentioned on Twitter the other day you were talking about Encarnacion and his K rate, and, and this has been a big thing uh, with your metrics over the past 18 months, Mike, looking at, at K percentage and, and walk percentage and contact rate. Um, is this, you know, in this advanced age, as you mentioned on Twitter and in a couple of pieces that you've written, is, is it possible that, that Edwin Encarnacion is heading down that path in a similar fashion as some of the other older players that we've had here in Cleveland? Or is there something else more concerning to you right now? Uh, Encarnacion, of course, has been noted by a, a bunch of people, struggles in April. And, and while he's certainly, like, I, I want to say his swing and misses are, are at almost 50%, if not 50% right now, which is, I don't know, 40, 30% higher than what they usually are in April. But, um, of course, we're only in, you know, we're not even to the 15th yet. Uh, is there something else more concerning than Encarnacion to you, uh, as far as the year progresses, uh, and how can how and how it? I'll just stop there. So my point with Encarnacion is really, I think the Indians can get surplus value from the deal and him not be the same duty was in Toronto, and I also think it's pretty reasonable to just say like. 
He had a major K percentage spike last year. He looked awful this spring in K percentage. He struck up ni- struck out 19 times in like 50 plate appearances, which is horrible. And it's continued into the regular season. So while his K percentage has traditionally been highest in April, um, and I think that's like a really good counter, I also just think, you know, like I think there's a chance that could also marginally increase again. And I think that while he has room for a marginal increase to still be an awesome elite bat, I think we start talking about just like an above average bat pretty quickly if it's more than a two to, you know, more than 2% increase. So it was just, uh, you know, let's follow this. Let's pay attention to this because it's been a big problem. I don't care about him grounding into a double play, you know, and I know he's trying to break out of stuff. And so that doesn't frustrate me that much, but I'm just a little worried about this. I think this is something we follow. Most concerning to me might be, God, I don't know. I mean, nobody. I'm really worried about the human being that is Jan Gomes and that he hit a, ball, a bunch of balls really hard early. Um, and then recently he sort of had that psyche tailspin in the, in the batter's box that we've seen before where he looks lost, he looks frustrated. Um, and that's to me, super scary. Well, how long, how long, I don't know, before, people... how long before they teeter totter that it seems like Gomes is clearly the starter. I mean, how long before they teeter that totter and how long before Roberto Perez starts playing more? Is this one of those things that Francona is going to be struggling with for three months um, where Perez is getting a couple of starts a week as opposed to every other start or flipping it the other way? Um, or do you try to let Gomes play out of this? Is he that important even though we have a Perez, that we get him somewhat right. Because right now, you're right, man. The second series and, and heading into the third series, I mean, he just looks like you and I probably would look out there. Yeah, I just want to give him a hug. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, that's what it's been like for the last year and a half, too. And we've had the injury excuse. Um, obviously, we want to see more time and sort of wait and hit some balls hard. But I just really worry about that guy in terms of – you know, I think there are times where he'll hit the ball really hard, he doesn't get good outcomes, and then he goes in these, like, K percent, these strikeout circles and funnels. One thing I do want to get out of the way, I know some, I think Adam Burke posted some really good stuff about this because I know some people. Shout out uh, to Adam Burke. Follow him at Skating Tripods. Some people sort of uh, jump the gun on Mr. Kluber early. Kluber's friggin' fine, okay? You ridiculous people. He's fine. You In his first... Just wait, just wait. You took heat because you said... I re- Two years ago, you took heat because you said he was still going to be elite, just not as elite as a Cy Young season, and you got slaughtered. This year, we're getting the he's done. It's just ridiculous. Well, and it's like... The guy didn't throw many breaking balls during his first start because he had a blister. And, like, if the blister becomes a sizable issue, like, we can talk about. That's a different conversation. But if you look at his first two starts, it's, like, purely related to his pitch usage, which is obviously being affected by the blister problem. So if you want to overreact like an asshole, I'm looking at you, someone, on Twitter, who I've blocked. Go ahead and do that, but that's not a problem, and I'm not going to worry about it yet. All right, well, let me counter the Corey Kluber. I want to throw a positive out there, probably the biggest positive to me, and I'm going to throw a hot take, and maybe it's not a hot take. Uh, Mike, Carlos Carrasco is going to win the Cy Young this year. I'm not even going to say any any more than that. I think – Thank you know random injuries and random things have kept him from kind of reaching that elite status. Uh, I think you could see it in start number one with with Carrasco, where he struggled early and he struggled a little bit last year with that, and then got it right, and he's been right ever since. What do you like best about Carrasco's start? I mean, obviously, you know when you talk about stuff. Uh, he's utilizing all of it right now. I, there's still a little bit of that isolating pitches as, as Kluber's been doing, but. Um, he's got this arsenal that I think is a, I don't want to say a full step above Kluber, but he's 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 got every pitch is a plus pitch. Is this the year that he a stays healthy and b leads this team from beginning to end? I mean, the only enemy to Carlos Carrasco of ever winning a Cy Young award is staying healthy. <laughs> I mean, like that's the thing, and that's the thing I can't measure. But yeah, his arsenal is awesome. I think 
like Corey Kluber has won a Cy Young Award, was like third last year, has awesome stuff, and I think Carrasco has better stuff, which is freaking insanity. Like he just has to stay healthy, and uh, let's do it. Let's see it. Two hundred innings from Carrasco, and he wins a Cy Young Award. I don't know what happened to Carrasco in between the injury and between getting suspended and getting put into the bullpen. I don't know what the Indians did or if it was just one of those things where Carrasco's family life kind of shifted his thinking. But if you think back, Mike, to when he, he, you know, he had his Tommy John surgery, uh, was beating guys in the head to now. It's such a dramatic change mentality-wise. I mean, the thing that you can say about Kluber, Kluber clearly went to the two-seamer, worked worked on one bullpen session, and that's miraculous in and of itself. His arsenal um, and his thinking and his makeup have not changed. To me, the thing that's changed for Carlos Carrasco is the mentality. I mean, he has gone from an erratic guy to a guy who we're literally – legitimately thinking could be the front runner for, for, for the Cy Young in the American League. Is that a is that a Mickey Calloway thing? Is that a Terry Francona thing? Or is that just he grew up in, in a six month period? I don't know. I don't know who deserves credit for that. That's a really good question. I think he really is an outlier in terms of I think it's pretty rare that you see guys who have the track record like him, you know, awesome talents but sort of a little bit of mental fragility early in their career sort of just completely turn a corner. And that's what Carrasco did. And I don't have any explanation. I think that maybe 15 years ago, someone will write a book that will be really good that might tell us about it. But right now I'm just happy it happened. Okay. So I, I, I want to keep this fairly short. I, I just have three other points, which could be three <laughs> hours, but they'll be short. They'll be short points. Cause I'm going to combine two into one. I, I contend Mike that, um, the Indians are going to win. I, I think the Indians are going to win the division with the front runners, and I don't know that there's much that's going to change that. But um, I think that the difference between the Indians being a really good team and being a great team are Danny Salazar and Trevor Bauer. And, and this is no knock on Josh Tomlin. I think Josh Tomlin is what he is. Um, you know, we continue to see Salazar kind of – we, we see him struggle, I think, with location a little bit. I think he, you know, I was watching him call off Roberto Perez yesterday. I think it's smart having Perez catch him. Is 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 Salazar ready to take the next step? He, you hear all the right things from him, but I, I'm seeing a little bit different. He did write the ship. I mean, this he pitched really well yesterday. I, don't get me wrong, but um, can he take the next step? I mean, he's got such an he's his stuff is so elite that. That slurvy split change that he's got is so effective when he's throwing it well with that four seamer and and you know when he's mixing in you know that the, the, he talks about his off speed stuff and he he talks about throwing it three or four different ways and you realize all the people that were saying he was a two pitch guy is are insane is 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 he ready to take the he's twenty seven now he's not young anymore is he ready to take the next next step or are we still a little ways out I mean let's not forget the first half of the year he wasn't even arguably the best pitcher for the Indians. He was the best pitcher for the Indians last year. Can he extend that, uh, or are we still going to see these these bouts of struggle with him? And then on the the other side of this, uh, Trevor Bauer. You know, everybody every year seems to say he's going to be the one that turns it around. And you know, we keep seeing you know we keep seeing him you know do some good things. He looked decent in his first start. He obviously had his best year uh, in a lot of ways last year performance wise. I mean, is is he ready to start locating the ball better? Uh, becoming a little bit more efficient, uh, keeping the ball down in the zone. Uh, he likes to climb the ladder a little too quickly, in my opinion, but that's beside the point. Um, it seems like this year he started off working uh, inside a lot more on lefties, which which he struggled with last year. He was out and over the plate a lot. Do you see um, uh, Salazar taking the next step? And, and really the big question to me is, is Trevor Bauer. I think while Bauer doesn't have the electric stuff that Salazar has, the arsenal to me is very similar to to Carrasco's if he can harness it. Uh, are we going to see these two step it up, or at least one of the two? What's crazy is I think if you ask me two years ago when you and I were pushing the Salazar train, I would have said if I was going to bet on either of these dudes, it would be Danny Salazar. And I'm still really high on his future. Um. He just doesn't command the fastball very well yet, and I'm just keep waiting. 
The stuff is all there. He just has to get ahead more often. He just has to command the fastball in the zone more. And I think <sighs> Bauer, I think, is making improvements in terms of how he commands the baseball. He was really bad a couple of years ago. He improved last year. I thought his first start was really, really good, and he had a you know a weird strike slash ball call, and then a ball hits the pole, and he's down three one. But he struck out a bunch of dudes. I thought he really commanded that game against a really good Arizona lineup, which I think people don't really know a lot of the names. But I think that's a really good lineup with Pollock, Peralta, Goldschmidt. That's cool. tough. Love that. And he was that. really sharp. Um, so I think I'm sort of for the first time in like two years, a little more positive about Bauer figuring it out and making a secondary leap than Salazar. I mean, Salazar has the stuff to be dominant, but he just... Watching him try and come in the fastball gets so frustrating sometimes. No, And, and, and watching him shake off Roberto Perez pisses me off. Like, and I, I, I mean, to, to me, that was, the, that was the big deal of the game to me is you could see Perez getting pissed. Um, it, it just, it's, it's interesting to me that, I don't know, you, 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 you hear the right things from Salazar, but man, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. We'll see. I, I, it's funny that we're talking about that with Salazar, and we've got, we got we're, the opposite side of that coin is Trevor Bauer. I don't know. It, it yeah. hopefully one of the two, and I, I do liked what I saw from from Bauer and where he was working his pitches, and you know he can run into I've got too much going on syndrome when he's on the hill, but he seemed to keep it together really well. I love his fiery spirit as well. Um, he's got he's got Ace Elite all written all over him. I just hope that he can kind of command the brain of uh, being that it's a pretty elite brain as well. All right, I, I lied. I got two more things. One's going to be fairly quick. Uh, we cannot go a full podcast without talking about Jose Ramirez. Jose Ramirez at second base, Mike. Honestly, we've been championing him for the second base job for three years now. He's finally got it. Is is could this be? And I, I I'm not saying Kipnis isn't going to be back at second this year. He is. But could this be a volley for Ramirez? Could this be something that either Terry Francona notices, you know, how elite he is on a regular basis at second basis defensively? Could this be an opening volley that next year during spring training we could see an opportunity for him to take second base? I'm not going to I'm not going to get into the whys. I'm not going to say, you know, is is Kipnis going to move to another position? Are they going to try to deal Kipnis? I'm not saying that. I'm just focusing strictly on Jose Ramirez. Um, if you're going to put your best t team together defensively, how does Jose Ramirez not play second base, especially considering what we've been seeing from Yandy Diaz at, at third? And, and, you know, we've got uh, some other guys <laughs> down there. Yeah. I got, got J-Ram in there and Yandy in there all at once. <laughs> yeah. Man. Wait. It's, and no, I don't want to – I do want to say that I've always – Last year really impressed me with how hard Kipnis has busted his ass to be a yeah. competent defender at second for a guy who played the outfield into college, into his junior year in college. I mean, that is awesome. Uh, but Jerem just plays defense at a different level than Kipnis. It's not close. Jerem threw a ball um, running away past second base from center field off balance yesterday that's harder than – Kipnis throws the ball planted sometimes, uh, let alone talking about the range to make that play. I just, they're not on the same level. Ramirez turns double plays so well. If you watch Kipnis over the course of the year, there's going to be four or five balls. You're going to get super pissed, and that's an out. You know, you're leaving it out on the table. I just, J-Ram is an elite defender at second base. It's reality. Um, I had some really nice fans in front of me who thought he was a terrible defender there last night until he made that play in the seventh. That was fun. <laughs> I Indians fans, I don't really like sitting in the park with you that much. There's a lot of hot takes. Just a lot of hot takes. Uh, okay, but so, he's exquisite. He's exquisite. So, so, you know, I mean, you know, looking ahead, you know, I – I, I wrote a piece three and a half years ago talking about comparing Jason Kipnis uh, physically to a guy like Greg Jeffries, a former player who was a middle infielder, moved to third, eventually moved to first in the outfield. Uh, could he, uh, you know, I mean, is Kipnis a guy, especially when you talk about durability? And this, again, you know, uh, this is a guy who historically has struggled at late in the season. I mean, could you see a guy like Kipnis who is athletic and who works his butt off? He's, he's as, as, blue chip a white collar guy as you can get is this a guy who you put in at first base 
if they don't sign Carlos Santana. And I know this is down the road, and we're in week one of 2017, but just, just curious on your thoughts there. I don't know. I don't really know if I can talk about this topic without coming off super hot takey. Okay, let's stop. Let's not, because I do have one more thing to say okay. before we wrap things up. And I did promise we wouldn't take our typical like two hours in, in the pod. Um, all right, so a final thing. We got Lonnie Chisenhall coming back today. The Indians sent down Tyler Naquin, which – I think 18 months ago, a year ago, maybe less than a year ago, I, I, I don't know, maybe sometime around July, the Indians started making moves that we expected them to make, even though we didn't expect them to make them, if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It seems like it seems like a lot of the moves that they should be making, they're starting to make. Is this because they're making the best move available. I mean, moving Naquin down was clearly the right move with the way Almonte's been playing. I think in previous years we might have seen something different. Or is this just a uh, just the way things are working out because guys like Austin Jackson are performing better than they thought? You know, it was one of those things. Yandy Diaz stays up, and everyone's like, "Well, see, they you guys were wrong." But at the same time, there were reasons for Yandy Diaz getting picked instead of some other guys. Or you know, Kipnis isn't injured. Yandy's in Columbus. So is this just the nature of the way the dominoes fell and they kind of fell the way that people see them? Or is this a maybe a shift in, in Francona's call or maybe the front office saying, hey, how about this guy? Gosh, I don't know. It was so nice to see them make the right call. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've watched a lot of a lot of Michael Martinez type moves. You know, well, he's still on, he's still on the roster. I mean, let's not. I know he's still on the roster, and I've not said his name yet. I'm just I'm throwing it out there for those of you who knock me for ripping on that guy. Not said his name once. I did. You're welcome. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I just it is great. It's fantastic. I mean, Alante can play multiple outfield positions. He makes a ton of contact. His plate appearances are awesome, and Naquin. You know, like, he has to make structural changes or else there's some significant limitations to his big league career. And, you know, I, I talked to Dave Wallace this spring, and he was relatively optimistic about those changes, you know, Naquin's capacity to make those changes, but they're really challenging. Um, and I think, man, it was just the right move. <laughs> How, like, it feels nice, but it also feels like this is what we should expect. <laughs> Like, well, this is you know, what our expectation should be. On, I, 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 I want to hot take the next move because, you know, in three or four days, <laughs> Kipnis is coming back. And it, it, I don't really want to talk about that yet. I think we'll save that because I did promise a hot take full episode on the guy that I said I wouldn't talk about today. Um, I want to hold off on that because I think – if the next move goes the way that we ask in the way that we want, then perhaps I will shut my my mouth up. Uh, props to Austin Jackson, by the way. He's got some gas in the tank. I don't know how long that's going to last, but it's good to see him out there playing decently. I mean, he defensively looked great. Um, he hasn't really been tested all that much yet, and it is it is April 13th. So we'll see how that lasts, but it's good having a padding with him. I mean, if it's if it's a Mark Reynolds deal where we get him through like mid-May playing decent and then he kind of falls off the cliff, all you do is release him and off you go. You got guys down there. Um, all right, we're going to end it there. Um, anything, Mike, before we wrap things up that you'd like to plug or maybe throw a shout-out to? Well, I mean, you've really written the most recently. Definitely read Jim's piece on a little bit of Greg Allen analysis. He, does, he starts our Down on the Farm series, which you will see regularly. And we're coming for you. Um, I think also important is you should read. We're coming for minor league coverage. Is that, is my point. That, of course, <laughs> my point. Of course. Uh, also, you know, there's going to be three people that listen to this that get that comment, and the, and and it's either going to be they're going to laugh with us or they're going to be pissed. If you're laughing with us, thank you. If you're pissed off, it was what he said. All right, go ahead. <laughs> uh, also. Uh, importantly, Jim wrote uh, about Carlos Santana as a prototype, prototypical leadoff hitter. That's really fun. Um, I write these really annoying pitcher preview series every once in a while that drive me crazy. Um, people seem to really like them, so you can feel free to read those. It's, it's fun. It's fun, Mike, putting together these preview and review pieces. 
where he wants to take 10 to 15 minutes to like pound these things out and three hours into it, he's sending me text saying, what the hell am I doing? They're great. Oh, though. Yeah, no, they're fantastic. I mean, nobody, I mean, if you're going to write a preview and you're going to write uh, you know, a, a, a gamer, at least have, you know, the insight. I mean, nobody wants to read about ground balls and double plays and scores three to two. We've all watched the game already. We don't need that, but I would like to, I, I love the fact that, and Mike, man, you're throwing yourself out on the line. I love it. Like you're you're predicating these games with how a batter is going to attack a hitter, or how a pitch, or how how batter is going to attack a pitcher, and how a pitcher is going to attack the hitter. And I kind of like it. You're putting yourself out on the line, and and often you're right. So if you haven't wa- listened to those, do you like how I stole that from you? Yeah, <laughs> but you fair. should you should really you know I'm I'm not a big gamer guy, and and we still do them at WFNY, but I think everybody who's doing them right now between Michael Bode. Michael and myself, and then ultimately Jeff Nomina, and then I'm going to plug someone here in a second. We're going to have five guys working on these things. Now, I think I think we do bring some interesting insight to those. So read our gamers, and you'll never, ever hear me say read a gamer other than the ones that we do, especially Mike's preview series. My concern is they're going to think it's a thing and expect me to do that because I am not do. Oh man, I'm not doing a preview and a post game thing. That's on you. Man. It takes so much time, man. <laughs> My wife's gonna leave me for those preview pieces. <laughs> well, I mean, at least they're original. So if if that does happen, at least you've done it for the cause. All right, my, my That's a good Will Hunting clothes there. My my at one least I'm original. <laughs> How about them apples? All right, my my one plug is where we've added somebody. I'm not going to say who because it's not. It is official, but I want to wait until the w- website kind of springs this person upon you. But uh, if you follow uh, if you follow Indians Twitter and you, and you like seeing some interesting numbers and you like seeing some interesting outtakes, uh, WFNY has added uh, an EHC member by maybe not by writing for EHC, but as his connection to all the writers and all the people at EHC. Uh, so we have a new member coming to WFNY who's going to be familiar to everybody who listens to this podcast. And if he's not, um, I'm not going to give you his name yet, but. Pay attention to WFNY in the next week or so, and you should see some new content coming from a new producer of con- said content. Oh, and by the way, uh, one other plug, and I'm not saying this is connected or not, but one last follow. Um, if if, if uh, you're on the Twitters, you should follow this guy named Kevin Dean on Twitter. I'm not saying those are connected. Um, it's, I don't know, it's, he's got one of those wonky... I don't know what his Twitter handle is, Mike. It's like at K V N B S B L. If I got that, find him. they know yeah. who he is. Find Kevin Dean, look around, peruse, love his stats, know that more of that's coming to you from somewhere. I'm not sure where. That was just the worst. I'm just the worst. <laughs> All right. Um, tonight we got Josh Tomlin on the hill. Don't want to talk about him yet, although I have some ideas for him in our next podcast. We'll get there, though. I want to get through this next Trevor Bauer start. Uh, thanks for joining us at EHC, the best podcast in the history of the planet, if you like us. If not, well, too bad. All right. On that note, we'll see you soon. Probably soon. Bye.